Hi everybody, good evening. Welcome to the webinar. It is Monday, October 24th, 2016. Tonight's webinar is the foundation of wilderness therapy. Some of you may have heard this presentation before, but this is really where I talk about what wilderness therapy is and why we think it works so well. Years ago, I was asked by a colleague about the theory of wilderness therapy and his model was very intuitive, very magical. There was a lot of, of symbolism in, in what he thought and why he did it. And my response was, I think we owe it to our families, I think we owe it to the professionals that work with our families back home to be able to describe the mechanism. What, why does it work so well and what exactly are we doing in order to make those changes that are realized in wilderness generalizable, in order to carry them forward. So with that in mind, let me talk about this basic idea. When I was in undergrad, there was a class that we took about sociology of the family. And it was called Temporal Relationships and Spirituality in the Home. And what we were looking at is the way that different societies, the way that they supported the family, the way that, that family perpetuated the values, the beliefs, the traditions of individuals in these families. And we watched a couple of, of documentaries back to back early on in the class. And the first one we watched was of the mother of the year in Utah. And it was quite impressive. Her approach was very disciplined. She was very active. She was very thoughtful about what she did. She, she put a, a tremendous amount of effort into raising her kids and, and teaching them the values that she wanted them to learn. She had structured playtime. She had structured school time. While they slept during nap time, she would clean up the house. And at one point when the, when the kids were playing in the playroom, she stopped them in order that, that they could have calisthenics, in, the, in order that, that they could exercise. And I'll get back to that in a moment. And overall, it was an impressive display of motherhood and intentionality and, and energy. And then the next day, we watched a documentary on a primitive tribe in Africa. And there was the division of labors, labor in this tribe where the mothers took all the small children, the fathers and men of the tribe took the older boys and they hunted and they gathered for food. The mothers stayed near the village and they made baskets and they took care of things around the village. They fished also and they carried the babies with them. At night, when everybody returned, they would tell stories. They would talk about the legends, the religion. They would sing songs. And what was fascinating about this family was that everything was woven together. The, their religion, their, their oral tradition and legend, their struggle for survival was all wrapped up in the same story, right? It was integrated into their lives. And then we look back on, on the mother of the year, and what we saw was a lot of her lessons were contrived. That is, they weren't natural. When the children slept, she cleaned. She didn't include them in the cleaning. They were actually playing and jumping around in the playroom, and she stopped them in order to have physical exercise. And what the professor was illustrating was this idea that this idea that she talked about from Abraham Maslow. He was a sociologist. And he suggested that you need to get your basic needs met, right? Safety and physical needs met in order to work on higher level needs, needs of belonging, needs of developing the self, self-actualization, he called it. And he, he made this argument that unless your physical needs were taken care of, you could not work on those higher level needs. He suggested, he argued, that if you were struggling to survive, you didn't have time to think about what it meant to be a part of a group and what it meant to be an individual. But what we learn when we look back at cultures is that the cultures that integrate all those lessons together often do a better job of passing on those values. You don't have to teach the child of a farmer what you reap is what you sow. You don't have to have a classroom activity, a curriculum around that, because it's inherent in what they do every day. So my professor argued that all of these things can occur, in fact, essentially do occur at the same time, that Maslow was fundamentally wrong. A, a fundamental American cultural idea was off, and that families were now struggling to figure out ways to pass on values that were inherent in the struggle to survive. I think a lot of families can resonate with that because there are a lot of parents that I work with who struggled to be successful in their craft, in their career, and then later on found a lot of success, and then find it difficult to pass on that same ethic 
that same idea to their children. So the idea in wellness therapists is we integrate all of them together. That it is in the context of our struggles that we learn what it means to belong. That it's in the context of our struggle that we learn what it is to be an individual, who we are, what we're made of. All of those things become integrated. So you have these ideas. We, we use the bow drill fire. We have students, clients carve spoons. Everything is, is not taken for granted in the wilderness. Nothing is handed to you. Right? You have to work for it. You have to work to stay clean. You have to work to keep the bugs from biting. You have to work to build a shelter to protect you from the elements. You have to bust or, or make a fire by rubbing sticks together in order to stay warm, to eat hot food. Of course, we provide them with safety, so if they couldn't get warm, we would keep them warm. But essentially, it is those lessons that get come in the mix of the challenges that, that are the best teachers. You don't have to give a long lecture, I always say, to a student when their tarp falls down at night because they weren't paying attention. You don't have to give a long lecture when a student or client isn't paying attention to the directions for, for packing their pack and then they end up with a pack that's lopsided and uncomfortable. You don't have to give them a lesson because the staff are out there just trying to help them to be safe, right? When we, when we talk about it in the wintertime or in the hot summertime, our staff say to us, Brad, how do we do therapy when so much of our day is spent on logistics and safety, and my response is that is the therapy. It's this backdoor approach to talking about frustration tolerance, delay of gratification, problem solving, communication within a group, listening, being humble, learning, being open. All of those things are inherent in the daily wilderness, in the primitive living model. And they don't come easily, and they don't come when we take them for granted. One of the earlier pioneers of wilderness therapists, wilderness therapy observed this. He said, this was quoted in, in Will White's dissertation, whenever we adopt what we've come to call contrived experiences, the overall impact diminished for the participant. So we, we try not to overlay too much on our wilderness groups because the natural experience of the day becomes the grist for the mill, the grist for the therapeutic mill. That becomes a part of what they do every day. So why wilderness? Why, why makes wilderness a, such a powerful delivery method? It offers, first of all, metaphors. And metaphors are fantastic at bypassing resistance, right? That's why people use stories. That's why they use analogies. That's why they use parables. Because those can take hold no matter where you're at, they can take hold of the unconscious and begin to sprout seeds, to begin to grow. When you walk in the front door with therapy, like a lot of us do as parents, because we're overwhelmed, we lack creativity, we can't think of another way, we think that this is work, we think this is how children operate. When we walk into the front door of therapy, we're oftentimes rejected, which makes sense because the adolescent brain, the 13 to 25-year-old brain, is programmed to separate itself from parents. And so they will throw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater to identify themselves as separate. That's why the son or daughter of a teacher fails in school. That's why the son or daughter of a therapist doesn't talk about their feeling. Right? Why the police officer's child is caught stealing on and on and on. I'm going to be anything but you. That is what I need to do to survive. So we offer metaphors. We use the bow drill fire. We use the activities during the day, how they're getting along with each other, to make parallels between family life, between peer relationships, between their escapism, their, their, their self-medicating behaviors. We use all of those in real time. There's a positive milieu, positive peer milieu in wellness therapy. That is to say that we have staggered the group so that there's open enrollment, so that the students, the clients, are learning from the more senior members of the group. Right? They're bringing that information to the newer members of the group. And what we know about the adolescent brain, the 13-year-old to 25-year-old brain, is that the peer becomes more important than the parent and that they're more open to ideas from the peer, the parent, because they're not wired to reject peers, right? They're wired to group up, 
to find their place in society. So peers do a fantastic job of teaching each other. And, and students and clients do a great job of teaching and learning when they're mentoring somebody else. They, they learn as much, they become more invested in what they're teaching. So having that opportunity. Figuring out your identity. You know, a lot of this is about self-efficacy. A lot of this is about who you are. You, you're stripped down of all the distractions, of all the escape routes. And you're left with yourself. Going on solos, going on a difficult hike. A lot of my clients and students over the years would talk about a specific hike or a specific challenge where they apply that, that metaphor as a model for their life. So finding out who you are through going through some challenging experiences. It works well with resistant adolescents. Self-esteem and accomplishment, I talked about that last week, about how there, there are a couple of great contributions to self-esteem, and one of them is being able to accomplish something, being able to make a difference in one's own life. I, I think for our, our female participants, it might even be more important because a common male identity is being rugged, doing something physically challenging and uncomfortable. That's a, a common cultural association with gender in our society. And, uh, and conversely, for, for girls, for young women, oftentimes there's not a lot of identity around being strong physically, about meeting physical discomforts and challenges. We know that they're resilient. We know that. They go through, they give birth to children later on in life. But it's not something that is fostered and gendered in, in the feminine, in the, in the female, in our society. So having them do uncomfortable things. That's why I think it might be more important for our female participants than our male participants, that aspect. The group becomes a microcosm, right? We don't have to get a long description from you. We do. We read the application. We hear about your child through our, on our first phone calls. We hear about your child in the impact letters. But the fact of the matter is we see in, in, a, in a week, we see how your child shows up in relationships. They tell us all that we need to know about them. That's why so many of you have the experience that your wilderness therapist could identify, could, could uh, analyze, could, could assess your child as well as anyone ever. Because it's a microcosm. We see it all. Removal from distractions and defenses, specifically electronic. I just spent the weekend in my, with my family in the wilderness in a place where cell reception wasn't available. And just naturally... We all spent more time talking to each other, making crafts, doing meditation, going on a hike. I asked my young children, what did you like best? And both of them said we liked the time just spending with the family, with each other. And again, we didn't, we didn't formally talk about <clears throat> that aspect of it. That was my intention, but it just happened naturally. So the removal of, of distractions and defenses, those escape routes. You can't manipulate wilderness. You know, Mother Nature is the one parent you can never manipulate. She doesn't care. She rains, she snows, she sends insects, she sends wind, heat, and you have to deal with it. And so you start to make this about the child and, and, and the universe and the world and life. And you take away from that equation the power struggle from child to parent. And Mother Nature becomes that surrogate, that, that substitute parent that they have to learn to adjust to, that they have to learn to work with, that they have to learn to deal with. It's a sterile assessment environment, although it's a dirty environment. Physically, there's dirt. It's sterile in the sense that we have so much removed, we have so much control over the environment, right? There are no drugs and alcohol. There's no media. Everything is being observed. Even when we see students who might have a negative impact on each other. We can observe that, right? It's the observed negative patterns and peer pressure. And we intervene there. So that's what I mean by sterile assessment environment. It's an opportunity to remove all, so many of the variables that we see encroaching, that we see affecting young people. And therefore we can make an assessment about what is going on and, and how to best intervene. Removal of negative influences, like I said, to peers, but also if there are negative influences, and of course there are, then we can observe those and intervene there. There's a certain kind of vulnerability, right? You're outside of your comfort zone physically. And that vulnerability leads to a kind of openness, to a kind of 
emotional expressiveness, willingness, ability, if you will, to feel. There's a development, there's an encouragement of interdependence, right? You, you can't do that out there on your own. Not very well. And it's so, I used to think about the, the powerful metaphor. We, we as therapists bring in food. We bring in fruits, food for our groups. The staff bring out food. It's something very special, very powerful that the people that are teaching you, that are mentoring you, are also feeding you, keeping you alive, checking your feet and your hands every day to make sure that they're, you're hydrated, making sure you drink enough water. Of course you do that at home, but you can't be 24-7 on top of your child. So in the wilderness, that is comprehensive. And there's a, there's a difference when somebody is handing you food to keep you alive. There's a difference that, that occurs in that relationship. The futility of old coping mechanisms. I, I think this is where they need to try the old things that work for them. They need to try to run away the same way they did before, sometimes even literally. They need to try the old ways of dealing with relationships so often, almost on a daily basis, we're finding ourselves saying to our students and clients, isn't this what you did at home? How did it work for you there? It seems to be working for you or not working for you the same way as here. So what does a typical day look like? I, I have written down on your screens, for those of you who are watching via webinar, a typical average day. You wake up in the morning, you have some kind of organization orientation meeting, you're cleaning up breakfast, you're getting rid of the fire pit from the night before, we call that crushing coals. You have a morning group, hiking, lunchtime. Always each day there's some personal time to work on therapy assignments, reading, crafts, things like that, things from the packet of work that we give to every one of our clients and students. You hike more in the afternoon, you get to camp, you, there are chores that rotate each day for the group, and it takes a village, if you will, to get camp ready. You set up camp, make a fire, dinner prep, meal, eat, um, and then you have a group therapy, a formal group, and then you go to bed at night. That's a, an average day, right? It's, it's camping, it's moving, it's nomadic, it's primitive living. And then, of course, all throughout the week and throughout the day, there can be standing groups, anywhere from a couple to ten a day that lasts anywhere from two minutes to 10 to 15 minutes. Group is happening whenever it's needed. Individual sessions with staff along and during the hikes. Layovers are days when we don't hike. Those are typically the therapist days. Some other days that we, we lay over, we don't hike because we're, we're doing showers, we're doing some other logistical things. Showers, of course, a couple of times a week. Divvying food twice a week, getting fresh fruit and vegetables every day. Personal time can happen according to how much each client, each student needs it. Each student has a, a curriculum packet where they have hard skills like busting a fire, making a spoon, making a shelter, following a leave no trace practice. And then there are soft skills like not swearing at people when you're frustrated, learning to listen, demonstrating reflective listening skills listening and responding respectfully to staff requests. Those are the soft skills. And then there's therapy assignments, things that are specifically designed and assigned by the therapist, book reading, papers, group, creating a group and a group assignment, service projects, you know, different approaches. This week I want you to try listening before you argue. This week I want you to ask for how you need it. This week, I want you to check in three times a day with, with what you're feeling. So there's therapy assignments on top of all that. Then, of course, there's an academic curriculum. For our adolescents, it is two high school credits. Letters to and from home are part of each week, various times. Solos are that 36-hour, excuse me, 72-hour uh, or, or more, sometimes a little bit less, experience where they sit with themselves. The staff come and check on them, but they sit with themselves with virtually no assignments and just stay present, feel, think. Sometimes they're allowed to journal or draw or there might be a theme for the solo. Then of course there are chores. Most importantly, what I would tell you is therapy happens all day long. I think a lot of parents are wondering what happens in between the therapist visits. That's where the real work is. It's all of this stuff, all of this stuff in the context of primitive living. I have some pictures here for those of you that are watching via the webinar. There's a Baudrillard fire 
a student spinning a bow, creating an ember and a fire. Of course, nature itself offers a kind of mindfulness, a kind of perspective on where we fit in the universe and how nature works to support itself. There's, of course, fun that happens all the time. I think that's one of the most underreported aspects of the program, from a participant to a parent, because they don't want you to know that they're having fun. But there's a sense of accomplishment. They do service. They go on long hikes. Um, they have fun at night. They play games. They observe beautiful things in nature. Like I talked about this idea, th this shows a couple of different exercises that students are going through. And, and again, we do talk about it, we do process them, but we let the metaphors, we let the ceremonies, we let the rituals speak for themselves. I love this aspect, differentiation and distance. This talks about the fact that part of what makes it effective is you pull the family temporarily apart so that each individual person can find their core, find out what they're feeling, find out what they need, find out who they are in and of themselves before they get back to relating to themselves. We do it through letters at first, eventually we can do phone calls and then visits. But the idea is the differentiation, that, that separation that allows for connection is created by the metaphor, by, by the actual ritual of the distance. They figure themselves out, you figure yourselves out more clearly. A lot of you testify to that. Letters from home, letter writing therapy for me is one of the gems of wilderness therapy because you're so far away, because satellite cell phones aren't a, a daily activity, it's a great way to begin a healthier patterning of communication. Creating rituals, they do it for each other. They do it for themselves. That's an important part of, of taking home the lessons and the ideas, the concepts. I, I love this idea of culture. I have a picture here of a Native American mural right, in one of our field areas. But the fact of the matter is this. There is this idea <clears throat> that we take them out of the front country and we put them in the back country, but the lessons, the values, the, the ethics, the principles are the same, but they don't come in the form of mother and father. They don't come in the form of their, their public high school or their private high school. They come in, in the form of these counterculture, tree-hugging, hippie staff. They come with their own culture. You'll notice this. We have a whole dictionary online of jargon. Right? We, we watch them create their own culture. And it's inside of that culture that they recreate the values that you're trying to teach them. So the fact that the vehicle is a different culture is very powerful. Some goals of wilderness therapy, getting their attention. This is kind of the kick in the butt idea. This was kind of the original idea of wilderness therapy in the old, old school days. I, I talk about it in terms of creating a new bottom. Right? This is an intervention to reset. It's, it's a great crisis management pause, right? A lack of safety, things are chaotic, things are spiraling. Wilderness therapy provides a pause. It provides a short-term decision for the short term. You don't want to make long-term decisions in a crisis, right? You want to make long-term decisions after a crisis. So crisis management intervention is one of the goals of the wilderness therapy. Individualized treatment plans. You're not going to get a higher level of care almost anywhere in any milieu, in any approach than wilderness therapy. And in that way, it's the most supportive. It's the, the one that gives the client, the student, the most support. An assessment in the natural environment as well as formal testing in the sterile, like I said, controlled environment. It's a great assessment tool. Even though we take all the information you provide us, we can make a very accurate assessment that would resonate with most of you, almost all of you, by just describing your, your child's interactions with, with staff and peer for the week. It's a great time to pause and do family work. I, I call it the, the Trojan horse of wilderness therapy, which is you, you send your child to wilderness therapy to save their life, or at least to improve their life. And what you find is you find that this work changes you. And there's a special access that we have to parents, a special willingness to work because this is a vulnerable process for them too to have their child in something so strange as wilderness therapy so it's a great opportunity for for systems focus and the culture of change 
It's a preparation for the next setting. Willingness helps move participants from resignation to acceptance to investment. You know, we typically see that procession, that, that progress in this process. There's a softening effect. It takes the sharp edges off demonstrative behavior, dangerous behavior. So your child will qualify for a different level of care after Willis than she or he would have before Willis. That's what I call the softening effect. It changes the level of care that your child can be successful in. It changes the level of support, the level of freedom, opportunities that they would qualify for, that they would do well with after Willis therapy. It's great for socialization skills. That includes those who suffer from autism spectrum disorders, NLD, right? It's a great small microcosm to give social feedback on social skills and training on social skills. The, the objective testing and the natural observation, is a, it's a fantastic milieu. That's why a lot of the times some of the best testing that, that happens for a child happens in the wilderness. There are uh, lots of studies. You can go to our, our website and look at the studies that we've worked on. We're always doing a long-term study, and we thank you for your participation. But these are some of the features that lead to efficacy. Relationships with the instructor. That is what clients say is the, the number one most powerful impact on them is, is their relationship with the instructors. That's not the therapist. That's the instructors. Small group living environments work. My son talks about still to this day, and this was 10 years ago that one of the lessons he learned, one of the most important lessons he learned is hard, easy, easy, hard. In other words, if I do the hard thing now, it can be easier later. If I do the easy thing now, it'll be hard later. So learning to work. Survival skills, that, that sense of efficacy, that sense of I can accomplish something uncomfortable. When clients come to us and say, I can't, my response is, I think you can. And sometimes I say that literally out loud. And sometimes I just empathize and listen. And then later on I said, remember when you thought you couldn't? And now it comes so relatively, so much easier to you? That can happen for the rest of your life. The natural beauty of the wilderness is something they identify. It leads to a reflecting, reflection and, and a meditative approach for our clients. That's what the self-report is. The physical and emotional challenges is something they take with them. Problem-solving metaphor and relationship skills, like I said. It's experiential. Because children aren't apt, aren't able, don't know where their trauma is, using experiential therapy to uncover that can be valuable. And learning using experiential therapy to heal that because we are wounded in experience and therefore we are healed in experience. We create competing memories with those old traumas. Active learning rituals, symbols and doing, by, symbols and doing bypass defense inherent and resisting, resisting populations, and then solos. These are all things that we look at in the research that, that make a difference. So what's the take home? The take home is to include in our own lives a mindfulness. That's not meditation in, in the lotus position. That is feeling what we feel, being present with ourselves, paying attention to what's going on. That can happen in therapy, that can happen in meditation, that can happen while eating. That can happen while walking. I was talking to a client today explaining this idea that she was upset about something and her friend was saying, oh, you're being ridiculous. And I said, wait a second. You're not being ridiculous. You might not know how to listen to, to your anxiety, to listen to your discomfort, but that doesn't mean you're being ridiculous. There's something there that you can learn from. And that's all about mindfulness. That's part of what you're doing while your child is with us. That's part of what you're doing during these webinars or, or in response to these webinars. Unplugging, I can't, I don't need to talk about that because we all know that we can unplug more from our devices. We all know the potential risks uh, of being so plugged in, so much living in a virtual world, not learning how to feel, not, not being comfortable with our feelings, being distracted, taking ourselves out of the present, all of those things. Learning the experiential aspect of life. I think as parents, we think about things as talking and lecturing so much, arguing and debating even. And we can learn that the consequences, natural and logical consequences, can have as much instructive and value as any kind of lecture. And that it's okay for our children to struggle. That we can value failures as much as we honor successes. Learning radical acceptance, that is, 
when it rains, it rains out there. I can remember when I was visiting my son in the wilderness years ago. I was so frustrated that the rain was getting in the way of our sessions. That was more than 10 years after I was a wilderness therapist. But as a father, I was frustrated that it rained on the day that we came out. And I remember thinking how irrational that was and how out of practice I was with radical acceptance that, that evening, that day. Learning to, to honor the journey instead of the destination. It's not about getting somewhere else, getting somewhere fast. I heard somebody talk recently about music as a wonderful metaphor for life. That the goal of music is itself. Music is not about getting somewhere. If it was, then the, the best symphonies would be the shortest. They'd be one note, the ending note. But music is, is for its own sake. Uh, like the master composer who played a sonata in front of a royal court and somebody asked, what does it mean? And the master sat down and played it again. So learning that this is, this is it. This is what, this is where we're supposed to be. This is what's supposed to be happening. Our children, our struggles, their struggles, those are our teachers. And that's part of what wilderness offers to all of us. It's part of what nature offers to all of us. Practicing healthy detachment. I think wilderness and, and the letter writing and the distance, I think it offers or lends a, a special aid in, in creating and fostering healthy detachment, detachment in families. In vivo therapy, I've talked with out pa outpatient therapists before about this idea that, that, that typical outpatient therapy is a little bit contrived, right? And it's okay to take a walk. It's okay. It's okay to play games. It's okay to do play therapy. It's okay to sit in a park. That what we know about wilderness therapy is that it can happen anywhere, doing anything. All right, questions. What do you mean that you don't overlay contrived experiences? Can you give an example of what that be? What I mean is we don't do too much of that. You don't want 50 group therapy assignments for a week. You don't want you know, dozens of pages of writing assignments for a week and reading. If we did all of that, there'd be no opportunity to walk in the rain. There'd be no opportunity to build a shelter, to work on bow drill fires, to carve a spoon. So we're careful to balance the value of the inherent lessons in wellness therapy versus all of the intellectual talk therapy ideas that we have for our clients, for our groups. All right, I'll go through a few of the announcements, and then if there are any other questions at the end, I'll take those. I'm excited. The play is in two nights. Going to see it. I saw somebody's already written me and said that they loved it. If you want to follow the play, it's on onguardarts.org. Uh, that's E-N-G-A-R-D-E-A-R-T-S dot org. Um, uh, upcoming workshops and intensives. Uh, we want all parents to go to the workshops if possible. The next one is November 12th and 13th. If you want to do deeper work with me in Park City, Finding You are, are the in, intensive uh, work, intensive um, intensives that I run, where we go into family of origin, current day struggles, spend a lot of time on you individually. Any age adult is welcome to those, November 10th through 13th. We want every family to attend six of these parent support meetings while their child is with us. If you haven't already and you're already done, please go to them. Al-Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous, Naranon, or Alateen. Parent support groups coming up. Uh, New York City on November 16th. Uh, sooner than that, Los Angeles on the 6th. That's a Sunday afternoon. Daylight Sevens ends the night before. That's in Studio City. We're going to have an afternoon potluck followed by a parent meeting. Then the following day in the Bay Area. Atlanta on December 1st. Toronto on December 12th. Stephanie at evoketherapy.com for more information or to RSVP. Follow us on social media. Remember that all of these webinars are now going to be available on podcast. Go to evoketherapy.com or go to SoundCloud on your Android device. Download the SoundCloud app and you can look us up there at evoketherapyprograms.com. Twitter, Twitter and Instagram. Facebook, the Alumni Foundation page for books. The Pursuits is for Young Adults. The book is on Amazon. Any last questions before we close this evening, Michael?
Michael, this is your last webinar with us. Thank you for joining us with these uh, webinars and facilitating these for the last year, Michael. Hope you have a great time in your new stop and your new venture. All right, folks. Thank you for joining me this evening. I hope this point of context is helpful. Um, the next webinar, uh, we'll talk about that. I'll look at my schedule and see what the next one will be. It will be November 1st, though, at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Have a great week, and I'll see you on the other side. Take care. Bye-bye.